What up, Coordination? On the pod today, we have Stephanie Lepp, who is an award-winning producer and creator of The Infinite Lunchbox, a production studio devoted to the acceleration of the evolution of culture in America. Former executive director at the Institute for Cultural Evolution, which is a nonprofit think tank devoted to uh, transcending polarization. And before that, she was an executive producer at the Center for Humane Technology, which was the organization at the heart of Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma. Um, Stephanie has won a couple of reward, awards, the Webbies for uh, Deep Reckonings, a series of, uh, of um, videos that imagine morally courageous versions of our public figures. On this episode, we talk about how crypto can solve problems associated with the meaning crisis, with multipolar traps, um, with social media. And so in this episode, we talk about different leadership styles, uh, how cryptocurrencies and the pluralistic mechanisms that they create are going to change the way the fabric of society and culture operates, or they could. And so I think that this was a really fruitful episode in thinking about how the stuff that Stephanie thinks about, which is our social fabric, evolution of, of our social media, intersects with the stuff that uh, we coordination think about every day, which is cryptocurrencies and crypto economics and, and using technology in order to create a more green pill and regenerative world. So really enjoyed this episode with Stephanie. She's just such a giga brain. And I think that you're going to enjoy this episode as well. Working in Web3 is awesome, but working outside of the typical W2 employee structure is a deal breaker for so many. Opolis is helping the self-sovereign worker focus on what they do best their work. Tax time is coming up. Opolis helps professionalize your business by helping you form an entity, generate proof of employment through pay subs, and receive a W-2 at the end of the tax year. Are you self-employed and forced to spend money on expensive healthcare insurance with limited coverage? Opolis leverages group buying power through a community employment co-op, helping you save 20 to 50% on high quality, affordable healthcare options through Cigna. And finally, Opolis's member owners share in Opolis's success and profits based on their work token holdings. You must be authorized to work inside the United States in select Canadian provinces to receive Opolis's benefits. Book a 30-minute free consultation with Opolis's experts and join Opolis by March 31st, 2023 to get a thousand work and a thousand bank tokens. Go to connect.opolis.co slash bankless to get started. And if you're going to East Denver, make sure to stop by the Opolis booth or attend their Future of Work Summit hosted by Opolis. The Glow Dollar is a new stable coin with a very special property. As the market cap of Glow goes up, extreme poverty goes down. Glow is a dollar-backed, non-profit stablecoin that creates basic income for people living in extreme poverty. Glow is basically the same business model as USDC with yield-generating treasuries on one side and a stablecoin on Ethereum on the other. But instead of being a for-profit company, Glow is a non-profit that donates 100% of all yields from the Glow Reserve to Give Directly's basic income program. Give Directly is a charity that gives people money, no strings attached, to people living in poverty and is a charity that Vitalik has previously donated to and supported in the past. With Glow, you can reduce poverty just by holding a stablecoin. Glow is launching in early 2023, and you can join the waitlist at glowdollar.org slash greenpill. That's G-L-O dollar dot org slash greenpill. Alrighty. What's up, Stephanie? How you doing? Hi, Kevin. I'm good. I'm surrounded by nonstop rain. Um, how are you? <laughs> Things are good out here in Colorado. Uh, really yeah. interested to chat with you. I think you and I have been going back and forth on Twitter for a long time leading up to this episode. Maybe a great place to tee off would be, uh, tell me about your work at the Center for Humane Technology and the uh, the Deep Reckoning series, excuse me, Deep Reckonings series that you did. Sure. Well, those are separate because I did Deep Reckonings before I got to CHT, but maybe just to start with the Center for Humane Tech. Yes. Yeah, so for those of you who are not familiar, the Center for Humane Technology was the organization that was featured at the heart of the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, uh, founded by Tristan Harris, who is a dear friend of mine, and um, basically doing the work of trying to uh, how might I put it, rescue uh, human consciousness from the onslaught of social media that is driving us down to the bottom of our brain stems. Um, the Center for Humane Tech does a, a lot of educational work and um, Tristan has testified before Congress many times and, and works with policymakers. I was our executive producer, so I was largely in charge of our podcast, which is called Your Undivided Attention. I think it's very worthy of your undivided attention. Um, uh, and also I worked on a few other media projects there, but, um, yeah, mm -hmm. that is the center for humane tech. Yeah. 
So I just, I just want to dive in on this idea. By the way, I'm a listener of Undivided Attention oh, and was a huge sweet. fan of The Social Dilemma. Um, hey. The race to the bottom of the brainstem kind of refers to the phenomena where since we have an attention economy, uh, there's an economy that is racing to the bottom of the brainstem. Uh, things like outrage and things that are very shocking to us. It, it's almost like there's an economy that's, that's uh, trying to drive content in our direction. Uh, I... I, I that's my understanding of the race to the bottom of the brainstem. Is is that how you would characterize it? Yeah, I mean, I guess the way to put it is uh, if if uh, if the way that social media makes its money is by keeping people engaged and engaged as much as possible for as long as possible, and what is the most engaging content? Often, it's the content that angers us and outrages us and polarizes us and divides us. There is so there's kind of a direct um, tethering between the you know the growing of these companies and the and the way that they maximize their short term profits and the driving us down mm -hmm. to the bottom of our brain stems to being polarized and addicted and outraged and angry all the time and so one yeah. enormous area of innovation would be the business model right the business model of social media that is not predicated on perpetual engagement but is predicated also upon uh, you know, people's well-being and and actually and and and, and uh, Tristan coined the term time well spent to have our time spent on social media be time well spent and to maintain our capacity to choose not to spend time on social media if we decide that other things are more worthy of our right. time or are more worthy of our undivided attention. Beautiful. I, 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 one of my ways of conceiving our current culture war is being as a result of the race to the bottom of the brainstem. If we're polarized in a part and we're just outraged all the time and at war with each other, maybe we're profitable for these social media companies, but it's kind of creating this culture war that's dividing the country. I'm curious what you think about that take. Oh, no, exactly. And now you're speaking to more of my recent work kind of since my time at the Center for Humane Technology. But yeah, yeah. my work is largely focused on integration, integration of different perspectives. Right now, we often see these perspectives as at war or there being a tug of war. It's either pro-vax or anti-vax, which is actually kind of meaningful, meaningless. Sorry, it's like we should be yeah. pro-vax in the circumstances in which vaccines should be used and anti-vax in the circumstances in which vaccines should not be. I don't think, mo I think most people are not prepared to say vaccines always <laughs> in all circumstances yeah. or vaccines never in no circumstance. And so we're all holding a piece of the puzzle, let's say, and we want to put them together and develop an understanding of under which circumstances to use vaccines. So yeah, a lot of the polarization kind of, in a way, I mean, maybe uh, this might sound like an over idealistic way of thinking about it, but we often end up with the with different pieces of the same puzzle. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Let's say, and we'll get into this with, let's say, in the world of cryptocurrencies, it's not necessarily one currency versus another currency. I could just say, thank God for the diversity of currencies. Wow, yeah. like, good thing we have a diverse portfolio of ways of storing and exchanging value. How grateful are we that we've given birth to so many ways of doing that? So then the next question is under what circumstances, if any, or under what, should these different ones be used, or how can we mix and match? You know, mm -hmm. how can we develop a meta, a, like a, you know, like a multi-currency way of, you know, rolling such that we are more resilient in the face of changing circumstances, changing economic circumstances. So, right. uh, yeah, we get split up into these, you know, different, whatever, echo chambers, polarized people. And so, and I'm kind of my job or part of what I try to do culturally is bring the pieces together. Right. Man. Yeah. Uh, that's that's so interesting. I, I'm reminded of this Sam Harris quote uh, that goes something like, nuance is the enemy of common understanding. And it feels like we're kind of, how do we go from these polarized echo chambers where it's just pro-vax, anti-vax, but we can actually encapsulate the nuance of, oh, we want vaccines in this scenario, but not in this scenario. Um, and then the other thing I heard in there was plurality creates anti-fragility. Um, how do we move from a world in which we've got kind of... Uh, in, we've got a plurality of ways of funding the commons and of representing our values and not just boiling down to the lowest common denominator of, of social media, but also, but also economics. Those are two of the, the threads that I, that I want to pull in there as we get into the crypto conversation. 
Totally. Amen. I mean, you're speaking my love language. How do we, how do we do this? I mean, that is the, and I think part of it, how do we, let's say, bring these pieces of the puzzle together? I, honestly, I, I don't, I don't see that much of it out there, but I do think, um, and I think, I think like some of what I see out there, let's say in the, in the anti-polar polarization space, um, is still at the level of of kind of like both sides is on <laughs> a little bit. It's like we heard one mm -hmm. side, we heard the other side. Okay, now we're done. It's like, no, 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 we're not done yet. <laughs> where's the integration? Right? Or as Hegel would say, where's the synthesis? We got the thesis, we got the antithesis, where's the synthesis? So mm -hmm. um and I can describe or and maybe maybe we can get there later, but uh yeah, I can there are um many <laughs> projects in the works, but that is that is essentially the goal is to start mm. showing us, teaching us how to do this and make it look more stunning and more beautiful than the only one sides kind of thing or than the both sidesism kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So my next question will be ridiculously unsophisticated, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. How do how do we how do we do it? And how does does crypto play a role at all? Yes. Okay, totally. So let's talk about crypto in this context of bringing the pieces together. So I'm going to I'm going to get nerdy here. I'm going to introduce a um a framework. It's a matrix. Um and then we're going to use it. We're going to apply it to crypto. So um and this is a I'm I'm going to I'm going to call it I, I call it an integral matrix. So um I'm just going to take a couple minutes and explain what it is and then we're going to we're going to we're going to try to um we're going to use it within the context of crypto and currencies. So basically, um, here's the introduction. So a like every couple months, I'm going to use the, the concept of leadership to explain how this matrix works. So every couple of months, uh, the Harvard Business Review publishes an article that's like, you know, what are the top 10 qualities of being a good leader? Right. As if there's like one way to be a good leader. Um, and so a few years ago, Daniel Goleman, who's uh, he's an expert in emotional intelligence. He did something that I found really brilliant where he oh, thank you. Oh, my God, Kevin. OK, so Kevin has this up on the stream. I'll, I'll explain it. So for listeners. Um, so Daniel Goleman, he interviewed hundreds of leaders, hundreds of business leaders specifically, and he identified six distinct leadership styles. And uh, you don't have to, you don't have to know what they all are, but I'm just going to say them out loud. So commanding, visionary, affiliative, democratic, pace setting, and coaching. And by the way, the map is not the territory. It's not that these are the six and only six. It's like there were clusters in his interviews that he identified, and they were this, these six clusters. And so just to give you a sense of the first three styles, commanding demands immediate compliance, visionary mobilizes people towards a vision and affiliative creates harmony and builds emotional bonds so if you can imagine a matrix there's the six across the top and then there's the next um row underneath it uh let's say like describes them and then what daniel goldman did is he identified the circumstances in which each leadership style is most effective so commanding is really helpful in a crisis <laughs> to kickstart a turnaround or with problem employees. Visionary is really helpful when changes require a new vision or when clear direction is needed. Affiliative is really helpful to heal risks in a team or motivate people in stressful circumstances. So he's basically identifying the circumstances in which each leadership style works the best, which is already really helpful, right? He's not saying one way good, other way bad. Different ones are helpful in different circumstances, but he goes further and he identifies each leadership style's impact on the overall organ organizational climate. And so commanding, surprise, surprise, has a really negative impact <laughs> because it really does not feel good to be commanded. Visionary has the most positive impact because it feels really good to mobilize around a shared vision. Affiliative is also, also feels positive because it feels good to you know, make up with people and get along. So to summarize, it's not that, right, commanding is always bad and visionary is always good. Different circumstances call for different leadership styles, but some leadership styles are more fun and fair and equitable and enjoyable for everyone than others. So if we're in a crisis, let's say, you know, I can tell my team like, yo, I'm going to shift into hard ass mode for a second. I'm going to become commanding in order to get us out of the crisis so that I don't have to be commanding anymore, right? I use 
we use the strategies we like less to get our, to change the circumstance to get us into a different circumstance so that we don't have to use them anymore. And so posed as a question, you could say under what circumstance, if any, should we use which strategy? We have many strategies for achieving the same goal. Under which circumstances should we use which strategy in order to achieve the goal? Some, and for some things, we might say none. There, there are some things that we might say under no circumstances should that strategy be used. Slavery, we're done, none, you know? But it, it does shift from strategy right, wrong, or like it's X strategy, good, bad, to under what circumstances, if any, which I think is a very helpful shift. Daniel Goleman did not make this thinking of it as a template <laughs> for right. doing this, what we might call integral strategy, but that's what I would call it, right? Because it integrates different strategies for achieving the same goal. And, and once you see the matrix in this way, har har, like once you see it, yeah. you start to see it everywhere. Like energy sources, under what circumstances, coal, nuclear, solar, wind, birth mm -hmm. control, under what circumstances, pill and or IUD and or natural, you know, tracking my cycles and or like, call me crazy, but economic systems, under what circumstances, communism, socialism, capitalism, you might think I'm insane, but I honestly think that's part of what China's doing. Like they mm. call themselves socialist, but I think they're actually very opportunist and they're just like shifting into whatever thing is going to help them achieve their goal. Right. Mm. So, so, you know, that is the, that's kind of the, the layout and what I was thinking we might do if you are willing to like get this nerdy together, if you think it would be interesting yeah. for your audience is actually try to do this for different currencies, including crypto. Right. Well, that's amazing. Uh, <laughs> just to summarize, uh, back for the list, listener, there's six different leadership styles that uh, Daniel Goldman came up with here. Commanding, visionary, affiliative, democratic, pace setting, coaching. This is not all the leadership styles, but it's just the six that were in this, this chart that we are looking at. And if you're listening on audio, that, that's just basically all you need to know is that they're different. They're good in different situations and for different types of problem styles. So uh, commanding is really good for in a crisis, kickstarting a turnaround, uh, whereas more uh, coaching is is better for long-term relationships and has positive externalities to the organization. So the way we transpose this to the question that I asked you, how crypto can help solve some of these problems is, um, at least the way I interpret it is that Okay, so since we can program our values into our money and we can build online communities and design them intentionally, uh, maybe we could kind of look at different pluralistic ways to have different leadership styles that uh, you, you build a DAO that, that solves for the race to the bottom of the brainstem might look different than a DAO that solves for climate change, might look different yeah. than an educational DAO. Uh, did I encapsulate that in, in a way yeah. that makes sense to you? Yeah, and I think the other kind of like way that it let's say like connects to crypto is like then when someone asks like why crypto you have a very clear answer to that question right it's like yeah. crypto under these circumstances in which other currencies are just not uniquely designed to be effective mm -hmm. so it just so becomes a really it's yeah th there's like a very specific answer to the why crypto question what, what would you place, I mean, just the major currencies in the world, I'm thinking US dollar, would you, my first reaction to that is that it's commanding, um, although the US <laughs> would call itself a democracy, Bitcoin, uh, you know, like, are, are there, are all of the currencies that are, exist in the fiat world in the same category, you know, where would you sort of place the major, the highest cap uh, currencies oh, on so this leadership style? Oh, I, I wouldn't have even thought to try to kind of like combine it with a leadership style, but that's um i mean maybe i mean i think i think i think the question you're asking though is like you know for this for in this chart the first row the in the matrix mm -hmm. the first row i think is actually modus operandi it's like how does mm -hmm. this leadership style work and yeah. i think the question that you're kind of asking it's like how does fiat money work? It's kind of a question we don't really ask ourselves because it's like a fish in water. It's like for most yeah. of us, it's the only thing we've ever had. So <laughs> yeah. it's like, what is the personality of fiat money? Like what, how does it work? Like how, you know, does it like preclude us? It, it is, it is commanding in the sense that like, it doesn't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Does it kind of force us to make money in it in order to, it's kind of like a closed 
I, I don't know. I mean, that, that would be yeah. a question. I, like, what is the person? How would you characterize fiat money? What are yeah. its characteristics? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, for me, something like the US dollar is so domineering and, you know, it's the world's currency and it has such a network effect that, um, you know, maybe it started out as visionary, but now it's just commanding of and pace setting for the world of, of how the world works. But the opportunity that I see is what if we're moving to a world in which every local community, um, and I'm using local in both the geographic way, but also like the across uh, mimetic niches uh, way is like, what if each each subreddit had its own currency and could program its values into its money? You All of a sudden you have a pluralistic, pluralistic ecosystem of local currencies, local both mimetically and geographically. What is the pluralism of that? Does that create a counterbalance to like the commanding style of the US dollar? Um, you know, maybe I'm leading the witness a little bit here, but that's that's at least how <laughs> I think about about us starting to create a diversity of, of pluralistic mechanisms to solve some of these problems that we started the episode with. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one one characteristic, let's say, of fiat money that kind of like comes to mind for me, and this is very like I'm going to be very much deferring to you here, but you know, it, it's um like time, let's say, like as compared to let's say time banking, or I don't know, maybe that's not so true, or a local currency. Let's um, is that yeah. um, when sh um, if if a lot of your money is like coming from way, way far away and being spent way, way far. I mean, I, I don't know. It just, it, it seems very, it, it seems very unresilient in a crisis. Mm. Yeah, cu currency. Yeah. Although I don't have, um, I don't, I don't have, <laughs> I don't have the, I don't have enough of a way to explain why, mm. but whereas um, let's say you were kind of do what, what you were just describing with your local and both senses kind of economy, um, mm. you would be a little bit more resilient like in moments of crisis, something like that. Yeah. Like, but I, I think it's like a really prescient question right now is how do we create more resiliency in our economies? Like you and I are recording this in a week in which there's been a bunch of bank runs across yeah. the United States for the last couple of weeks. And um, there's something about pluralism and intact fragility that I think gets really, gets really interesting there. Totally. Yeah. And one way you create resilience is having a di having a diverse portfolio of everything, of anything, of just making sure you don't have all your eggs in one basket. So already it's just like putting all your eggs in any one currency mm -hmm. sounds like a dangerous proposition, irrespective of what that currency is. But, I, you know, if you were to and you can like stop me if this is not the direction, but if you if we were to put four three or four, let's say just currencies on the top of this imaginary integral currency matrix. And they were, you know, fiat money, crypto, name to like time banking and something else. And we were to actually try to go through and kind of fill it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is that a, do you want to do that? It's, it's totally yeah. up to you. You want to do uh, that? Let's do it. Yeah. So fiat money, crypto, time banking. What was the fourth one? Um, you tell me. I mean, um, uh, like, like a local, like Ithaca dollars. Is that on the table still? Those kinds of. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> what else is on the or Or we yeah. Or we could do those three. That sounds great. Okay, uh, so let's start with fiat money and let's maybe just choose the US dollar since that's the one sure. that I think we're both most familiar with. And I'm gonna, uh, if you're following along on video, I'm just gonna share my screen, but we'll, we'll be talking through everything uh, for the audio listeners as well. This is awesome. I so, by the way, love that you're down to do this. Okay, so fiat money. So what, what would we say are like, what's the MO, you know, of fiat money? It's like, um, I think it's got the largest network effects. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to lead the witness here. You could, uh, I'll just be the, the typer. You can, you, you can uh, say what attributes jump to mind for you though. Well, we can say it's not like springing forth from like nature. It's like, it doesn't grow on trees. Like you kind of have to do something it's like time. Like we all have time by virtue of being alive um mm -hmm. i don't know how yeah it doesn't grow on trees may not be the but it's like you have to do you have to do it's like a connived mm. 
Let me show this. I want to say it's like fiat means by faith, right? So it's yeah. it's kind of like back, backed by trust in your government. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Which also means it's um it's prone to I don't know, it's um its value rises and falls with, you know, geopolitics and mm -hmm. great. All right, I mean, so maybe like, yeah. Okay, crypto. So, so, yeah. So maybe crypto. Um, most of our audience is in the ETH ecosystem. Um, we could do ETH to the extent that 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 feels comfortable to you. Uh, do you want me to leave this sure. section since I think that I'm the one who knows crypto yeah, yeah, a little please. bit more than two of us? Please, please, okay. please. Okay. So um, ETH as a cryptocurrency was the original utility was um, you're paying for computation time. Um, on the Ethereum mainnet. So basically, if I call a smart contract function, then it takes a certain amount of ETH in order to do that. Um, since then, uh, ETH has become money to anything in the ETH ecosystem. So it's kind of like with US dollars, the original use case was paying taxes in US dollars, but then it's kind of become money within anything that's built on top of US dollars. Um, and I think the value rises and falls with geopolitics, but I also think that it rises and falls with the utility of the Ethereum ecosystem. So basically what dApps are built on top of it and what are the economics of them? What's your reaction to that? What would you say is the biggest difference between fiat and crypto? Um, Algorithmic monetary policies in crypto and fiat money is uh, the monetary policy is based on the Fed decisions. I'd also say that the tech is somewhat different. Uh, the tech is World War II era with fiat money. And then with with ETH, I'd say the tech is novel as it, the, t the tech is is internet native, let's, mm -hmm. let's call it. And when you say algorithmic monetary policies, that means like it kind of like inherently adapts some, is, or something in a way that like the Fed like theoretically adapts, but is also like, a like I don't know, like constrained in a way by politics. Yeah, so um, I'm just pulling up for the listeners who are on audio, ultrasound.money, which is uh, a site that tracks ETH's monetary supply. And um, basically, there's an algorithmic monetary policy in which there's a certain amount of inflation, but it's offset by people, by, by the burning of ETH when the network gets really busy. And so at the time of recording, we're, we've burned about 67,000 ETH since uh, the merge, which was this event where Ethereum went to proof of stake. So um, the, the Ethereum ecosystem is like this highly tuned engine, this machine that the monetary policy either inflates or deflates depending on how congested the network is. Um, mm. Whereas the, the US dollar inflates or deflates based off of decisions by the Fed, mm -hmm. which is you know kind of a political totally. slash private institution. Totally. Does, okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, totally. I think that's great. Okay, cool. So which, you know, and we can kind of start to kind of like, you know, think ahead a little bit. And it's like, you know, this adaptive thing, this ETH, this sounds kind of actually ideal under normal circumstances, actually, to just have it like, run on its own and adapt to what is actually happening in like a data driven way. Whereas the fiat thing actually sounds like what should be used in more of like, I don't know, like a cri cri something where like someone would need to step in and override the algorithm and be like, whoa, mm -hmm. there's something that you might not understand that's going on, you know, mm -hmm. or something. But anyway, anyway, okay, so yeah, let's look at time. Let's look at time banking. <laughs> yeah, I actually do. So could you just explain what time banking is? Because I don't know if yeah. all, all our listeners so are familiar with it. So the currency is time. It's you. I mean, historically, and this, I'm definitely no expert, but historically, the idea was you have a local time bank where let's say in the, in the currency is hours and everyone's hours are equal. And so if I put in three hours of babysitting time, someone else can, you know, 
like take out three out or what I, you know, I, I, then I, then I have a three hour IOU that I can use, you mm -hmm. know, and, 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 and the, and, the, and like everyone's time being made equal is absolutely not. I mean, that is like the opposite of, I'm not the opposite, but fiat money is like, like mm -hmm. three hours of like a sh white shoe, you know, shoe law firms, whatever, versus three hours of a plumber. Mm -hmm which maybe makes sense under some circumstances to really value those like extraordinarily differently. And then there are maybe other circumstances, right? And we can define those when we might say, you know what, we're in a certain, like everyone's time got to be equal for a second in order to get us mm -hmm. out of this situation or because whatever, whatever, whatever. But so that's kind of the, that's the idea. Right. Uh, this, this might be sort of a, a shit post, but could I call this an algorith algorithmic monetary policy also? I mean, there's only a certain amount of time sort of derived from the universe. Maybe it's a very, if it's an algorithmic monetary policy, it's just a rudimentary uh, one hour equals one hour, time is yeah. equal, for, equal to everyone kind of policy, mm -hmm. monetary policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, may, and, so, and I should say, I mean, I don't, there, maybe there are time banks in which they've like calculated that, some people's yeah. time is worth twice as much, but I think that's actually part of the value of this currency. And again, like going back to the, you want to have a diverse portfolio of like, you know, that that's part of what makes it useful yeah. is that it is so different. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I remember then, like, yeah. I was just going to share an anecdote though. I went, uh, I was like traveling in Europe with my dad after we graduated from school. And I remember him saying that like time is the great equalizer because everyone has the same, like, it, even the rich and the poor, the time passes the same for them. And I thought that, that was like relatively profound that no matter how rich you get uh, or how poor you get, uh, you have the same amount of time. I mean, it's it's not necessarily true when you think about like rich people being able to um, buy more time if they have cancer or terminal disease or anything like that. But uh, at least when you're young and healthy, time being the great equalizer, I, I, I found like something interesting and profound about that karmically. Yeah, and that's that's perhaps the that's kind of that's perhaps the idea that time banks are partially built on is let's let's use the fact that we all have you know hours mm -hmm. to kind of um, kind of equalize things a little bit between us yeah. economically. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, uh, let, maybe we should uh, round it out by doing Ithaca dollars. <laughs> Which again, I don't. I'm not. But I I understand that the idea is 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 a local currency. So I guess it's similar to fiat, except for the fact that you can only use it in your actual geographic local community. Mm -hmm. And Ithaca is a town in New York that notoriously developed Ithaca dollars. And I think they became pretty successful. I don't actually know if they still exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I should have maybe looked into that. Thank you. Um, but um, right. yeah, then it just keeps the money of oh, use formerly used in Ithaca it was one of the longest running local currency systems, no longer in yeah. circulation. Yeah, but the idea was they wanted to keep like you can like think about think about what you do for a living and where think about where your money comes from and where your money goes geographically speaking. My money, mm -hmm. you know, my I mean, I do spend quite a lot of my I do spend quite a bit of money locally. Mm -hmm. um, but I also spend it, I, like, you know, buying things for my kids, like, I don't know, like, you know, it's like, I do actually spend, I, I, that would be, a, I'm sure there are some, uh, you know, like money tracking apps that show you your geographic spread, but um, in yeah. my geographic spread, I imagine is pretty, I don't even know. So the idea with local currencies is let's just keep it all, let's just keep it all local, like keep it here, mm -hmm. like support your everything. It's like your local businesses, yeah. your local schools, your local, li like just take it and yeah. invest locally. And there's actually speaking, now I'm getting a little ahead of myself with the matrix, but one anecdote that I think would be interesting. There was a, an eco village in Italy called Domenhor that had a local currency. So everyone, I think most people worked outside of the eco village. So they would get paid in fiat money. They would come to their little local, they would convert their their euros into the local currency and only use the local currency with between each other, which meant they mm -hmm. were growing this huge pool of euros that they were yeah. getting paid in and not using. And then when they wanted to make a big capital investment, like buy a new plot of land or something, they had all of these euros saved up. So you can mm -hmm. also mix and match. You can like play the currencies against each other, like get some, save it because you figured out with a group of people how to self-organize and get things done together. And then yep. you have the, you know, so, 
So that's kind of a, yeah, you can't, it's not one or the other too. Yeah. 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 Well, it feels like plural. we're designing for a world in which there's a pluralism of currencies. And you know, what's so interesting to me is having identified those problems at the top of the episode around the race to the bottom of the brainstem and false information and the culture wars and all that kind of stuff is like, what would have to be true to invent a currency that gets passed along on social media that's based off of, oh, I don't know, the value you create in the world, as opposed to like whether or not you can trigger a dopamine rush at the bottom of the brainstem. <laughs> in what way can we rewrite economies to be oriented around our actual human values as opposed to what's profitable for the tech companies? This is the way for me that we intersect where we started the episode with where we are now is yeah. designing economies that, uh, that instead of racing to the bottom of the brainstem, we're racing towards whatever our, our community values are and creating like a shelling point around, around those things. That's the way I connect them. Please, please do that. I would be a much more um, successful producer if you did create that currency. <laughs> and the question I then want to ask you, though, is do you think that, I think I maybe already asked you and I think I kind of know you're, but do you think that fiat money under no circumstances, do you think we should actually like wind it down entirely? If um, you had a magic wand. Well, I think there are people who think that way. I think that one of the beauties of the internet and the pluralism of cryptocurrencies is that we have this infinite canvas to design better mousetraps on. And, and I think that basically, well, you know, I'm a software engineer, not an economist, not financial advice, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, if we can program our values into our money, then we let the market compete for which money has value and is ascendant. And um, if fiat money gets out competed by things that are algorithmically denominated and, um, you know, like local value, you know how I said like nuance is the enemy of common understanding. Like I think of US dollar as like the ultimate nuance uh, destroyer. Like everything devolves down to, um, I don't know, like Budweiser and like advertising dollars in the US because it's so network based and so commodity. Monetized, but you know, a, a world in which most of our, or like a good portion of our income comes in like local community currencies, like public goods coin or Ithaca dollars that incentivizes us to be active in our local communities to me feels like a really interesting counterweight to the US dollar in terms of its commoditization and have, creating a market where those things can actually compete to me seems really interesting, but um, you know, I, I think that I'm, uh, you're on my podcast and I'm interviewing you. So I'll take the question back to you. You know, what would the <laughs> ideal uh, like currency experiment look like to you, in, in, especially knowing that we want to solve these problems that you identified at the top of the episode? What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I tend to be, can you put your, um, what you had back up on the screen? Sure. I mean, my, my general sense is that when we're giving birth to something new, we kind of have to throw spaghetti at the wall. You know, it's mm -hmm. like when we're trying, when we're giving birth to a new way of doing something like I'm, let's experiment, you know, like I don't need, and it's okay to me that if we try crypto on too many things and it doesn't work on everything, or that's part of what learning is like, we're just trying it on everything. So I feel like, I think we're just in the beginning of this like wild experimentation time and we should just yeah. let our, let, let it roll. Like, let's try, let's thank God really that we're giving birth to a new car, a new way of doing this. We've had, we've been very like, you know, maybe once upon a time, there were many ways or there was bartering or whatever, with different kinds of, and then there has been a whole period that has been so constrained and that's super, as we talked, that's super unresilient. That's so uh, fragile. Yeah. And so, yeah, let, let there be experimentation in this domain, please. Like, yes, let it be safe and responsible, but you know, I would, I would, pray that we would kind of come out of this period and are you familiar with the hype cycle maybe that's a the Gartner yeah, hype cycle maybe yeah, I can just explain it really quickly for listeners it's a it, it's just a it's just a frame it's just an idea of, of the different phases that technologies go through and there are so the first phase thank you first phase is the technology trigger which is just the introduction of the technology the technology is introduced the second phase is the peak of inflated expectations where we're like, this technology is amazing. It can do everything. It's going to save the world. It's going to, you know, like restore democracy. It's going to solve poverty, you know, because yeah. we try using the technology on everything because we're so excited about it. And then inevitably we hit the trough of disillusionment. It doesn't work on everything. And so we're like, oh my God, this technology is destroying, 
It's destroying our families. Look at the way kids talk to grownups these days. Like it's ruined the world, you know, and then, and then we realize what it's good for. We realize what it's not good for. So then we get to ascend the slope of enlightenment where we're like, you know what? This technology is useful for some things, not useful for other things. It's useful for what it's useful for. And then we hit the plateau of, produ of productivity where we just like use it for what it's useful for. And it kind of plateaus. I mean, I don't know how much you like, like whatever resonate with that, but I would hope that we are going to move. And, and now that we've gone through this so many times with so many technologies, you would think we'd be like, wait, I'm noticing a pattern here. And we could mm -hmm. like accelerate to the slope of enlightenment a little bit faster. I don't know if we'd be able to do that, but either way, you know, I would pray that we would get to a slope of enlightenment where we have like, yeah, identified the circumstances in which crypto are useful, which I think are probably many more circumstances than fiat yeah. money. It could be that that is the dominant way that becomes more of the operating system and fiat money really actually becomes more of like a plan B or a plan C or like right. only in emergency circumstances would we shift into commanding leadership and fiat money and we will only do it to get ourselves out of the circumstances so we can go back to crypto and visionary which is more fun enjoyable and fair for everyone mm -hmm. yeah it's it's beautiful the way you're sort of synthesizing those concepts i think we talked about what's the thesis what's the antithesis what's uh. what's the synthesis um i guess my yes and on top of that would be that i think of web3 is evolutionary um and we had the Byzantine generals problem solved, which is basically the double spend problem in a decentralized system that gave rise to, rise to Bitcoin. And Bitcoin had its own inflated expectations and trough of disillusionment. And through many market cycles of it going through that, we had Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin Cash and Litecoin and Zcash. Um, and then we have on top of that, uh, as evolution continues, we have these bull bear cycles between fear and greed uh, that are basically like their own little Gartner hype cycles, inflated expectations and trough of disillusionment. <laughs> and through that evolution, we have these Very currencies. That, yeah. Sorry, well, these, but, no, I just mean that like these, these, these currencies are all competing with each other. And now we're starting to get more like advanced nuances, nuanced currencies, like things like uh, Moloch DAO and, and um, MakerDAO and Gitcoin DAO and Coordinate. And, and so, so now we've got this whole like evolutionary ecosystem that's rising and falling together, but it's all kind of like competing with each other. And, mm. um, and so, you know, I'd be interested, like you run the experiment a thousand times, is it the more democratic or visionary experiments that always win? Are there scenarios in which the co commanding uh, ones kind of win? And, uh, you know, just that evolutionary, the, my, I'm trying to extend your thinking by adding like an evolutionary frame to, uh, you know, to like the battleground bet between currencies, but like, what are the ways that we could design an evolutionary ecosystem where we end up at like solving for the bottom of the brainstem problem? and yeah culture wars and stuff like that, because I think that that's a really important existential uh, question as crypto becomes more influential is like, how do we rotate capital and talent from like bigger decentralized casinos and Ponzi schemes, which like a lot of crypto is that, to be honest, to yeah. the more regen stuff that gives new business models to social media and to journalists and stuff like that. Uh, I guess that would be my question back to you is like, you know, how do we, how, how do we route solve multipolar traps? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And maybe okay. we should even explain what a multipolar trap is. I'm not sure the whole uh, all of the audience would know. Go for it. <laughs> oh, I, um, I um, yeah. I mean, if if you don't mind. I mean, oh yeah. Tra so tragedy of the commons is an example of a multipolar trap. It's when it behooves. I mean, actually, social media is a perfect example of this. It's because it's because if I don't do it, the other guy will. Right. And mm -hmm. so all the companies are competing to get more and more and more and more and more attention until game over, right? For mm -hmm. everyone, or tragedy of the commons, competing to, you know, fish in this, you know, like fish all the fish until game over, there's no more fish. And now you've destroyed, you've yeah. destroyed the entire game. So the, like, mm -hmm. how do we make the game more infinite? You know, how to, given, yeah. given these, you know, how to, or, or maybe as a, well, so the, yeah, how, I mean, this is a, and, and I should be clear, some technologies never make it to the slope of enlightenment. They die yeah. in the trough of disillusionment. And so it is, it can be dangerous. Um, but um, yeah. I mean, there's so many, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think the, 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 what's coming up in my mind now is just the, cause I hear this question, you know, framed in terms of, you know, do we, do we like take over the existing systems or do we build new systems? And, 
My yeah. general answer is kind of like everything, all of the above. We're all kind of perfectly positioned wherever we are to be doing, you know, if our work is in line with, let's say, uh, the frame I can give it in, is in line with making the game more infinite, let's say. Um, yeah. then I, all of the above, you know, like, so, like if you're, if you're, if you feel your dharma is to try to go inside of the big dinosaurs and try to change their hearts, like, please, by all means. And if there's also the Buckminster Fuller of just, you build your own thing and make those old things obsolete, you know, mm -hmm. I would say do it all. You know, the goal for me, as far as I understand it is, you know, to grow the team bigger and bigger until it includes as much of life as possible. So I don't, I tend to be not like an us versus them kind of yeah. a mentality um but i also very much understand where that comes from and i mean yeah. not where i operate tends to be at the level of culture of just like how we think um mm -hmm. but um yeah but uh I, yeah i think it's good, gonna take really lots of experiments your... yeah uh, lots it's of gonna experiments, take lots of experiments. So, so to me like the way i define multipolar traps is that like there's a first attractor which is like i'm going to do what's right for me selfishly but then if i do that it undermines the system upon which the game relies and then that's like the second trap where you have a collapse and, and you know the example that they use in meditations on moloch which is this famous uh essay on on uh, multipolar traps is that say you have a, a pond in which there's five fishermen that are all uh, fishing a pond where there's 500 fish per year that you could fish sustainably and each person gets 100 but like fisherman a realizes oh i could get 150 fish if i deplete but like i'm depleting the pond uh for everyone else and then fisherman b says oh this other one's getting 150 this other fisherman's getting 150 i'm going to get 150 and then everyone through their own selfish incentives uh erodes the foundation upon which they could sustainably be fishing this pond and that's the second pole of the multipolar trap is that you get systemic collapse and then no one gets as many fish as they would have if they had all just agreed to fish sustainably. And so solving that multipolar trap is like a cultural problem of how do we get the fishermen to work together to only do things sustainably. But it's also like an incentive problem where you can say if someone defects from the game and they start overfishing the pond, then all the other fishermen know about it and they can, fishermen or fisher people, uh, can, <laughs> can remedy it by, uh, by by, by basically taking like graduated sanctions against the people who are abusing the commons. And so for me, the question is, how do we create currency systems and cultures in which these people can coordinate instead of defect against each other? And um, once you see the multipolar trap, you see it everywhere. You see it in social mm -hmm. media, you see it in flying across the world in order to uh, go to a conference while you're polluting the atmosphere with carbon. And uh, I think multipolar traps are just super important thing for people to to understand as a framework for solving the problems that we detailed at the top. So there's my there's my swing at it. Thank you. Yeah. And, and maybe the one thing I, that was perfect, that was beautiful. And then maybe one kind of little detail I would add on the analogy. So it's also the case that some fishermen, let's say, or fisher people are much more powerful than others and maybe are mm. So powerful that they have the power to design the game or change the game. And right. so there's this idea, you know, don't don't hate the players, change the game, which I love. Beautiful. Thank you. Liv Bori is the person who says that. Um, don't hate the players, change the game. And some players have power over the game. And yeah. so it could be that that's part of the ask. Like, let's say, like, if I were to make it, you know, we didn't talk about deep reckonings, but the, my, if my imaginary Mark Zuckerberg would actually take responsibility for changing the system that prevents him from having the kind of impact he says he wants to have. Yeah. Yeah, I think that um, that problem is going to even get worse as we see AIs that are 100 times smarter than, than people <laughs> mm. in the next couple of years. It won't just be on the financial vector. It will be on the brains vector as well. Mm. Well, All right. I well, I guess maybe like a parting thing I can leave is um, we didn't quite. Um, yeah, for if 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 like yeah, the invitation would be to kind of think think for yourselves as you go about the world using crypto, using fiat. Kind of imagine for yourself, like hmm, like these different currencies. Even if I just think of fiat and crypto, and not necessarily including time banking or Ithaca dollars, but how would I think about the circumstances in which these different currencies should be used and how might I think about like having like a you putting them together in some kind of like pragmatically pluralistic 
meta currency strategy that can kind of yeah be available to us as mm -hmm. we pursue the infinite game in service yeah, of the infinite game yeah beautiful place to leave it i will have a link to the dow leadership style uh tweet that you sent in the show notes and then where can people find you online if they want to learn more about your work oh yes find me on twitter at steph lep okay well, I've really enjoyed our conversations and I think that the work that you're doing is so important for the future of humanity. And I hope that it Likewise. intersects with crypto more and more in the, the region. Me too. So that'd be great. Me too. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming. Peace and love. Peace and love.